I think we're going to uh, we're going to begin here. Not quite. I'm just clo- we're close. We're close. I'm trying to get us as close to being on time as I can, so that we can uh, we can stay on schedule. I don't want anyone to lose uh, the opportunity. So <clears throat> so. You want me just to you want me just to kind of talk a little sing. while? Sing. I was gonna see you. Know, you, want him, you want to hear him sing? I'd love it. Uh, listen, I, I can I can sing. I used to sing in my church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Eye of the tiger. Now that yeah, I can maybe I can maybe hum it, but I don't think I could sing it. So, but I, I was uh, moved the other night. Those of you that that heard uh, Eddie Roush in the Samaritan, where he was walking us imaginarily into. Um, you know, the cold in Romania at like one in the morning where the church was secretly meeting and, uh, you know, he went in and he basically had recorded them singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and of course, in Romania. And I thought to myself, that's such a powerful song because I sang that song at my uh, father-in-law's funeral many years ago. And uh, so it's a song that means a lot to me. So I was kind of emotionally touched by, by that. So, and it is one of my favorite songs. So, all right. What do you think, Doug? We're good. We're good. Whatever you, whatever yeah. Why don't we go ahead? Uh, why don't we go ahead and begin? I'll look at my co-timer over there. I've got 115. Let's uh, let's begin. And uh, do we have Doug's uh, PowerPoint up on the big screens? Looks. We up here? Do I? No, you're good. Okay. All right. Very good. Do, all right. So let me just uh, introduce. Mr. Stauffer, once again, we're now going to move into a section where we talk about the history of the pre-trib, post-trib positions. I'd like the audience to kind of come to order and settle down now so that we don't, uh, we don't cut into Mr. Stauffer's time here. And uh, we, he will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, Mr. Schimmel will rebut for five minutes. Then Mr. Schimmel will present his position and Mr. Um, Stauffer will rebut for five minutes. So this is section two, the history of the pre-trib, post-trib position. Mr. Stauffer, if you would begin. All right, we're Doug and Judy Stauffer, your partners for truth. And I just want to welcome you to today's session. And we're going to look at some things today that I hope will be enlightening to you. Um, I told you I wasn't going to tell you about that one anymore. This is History Disturbed is what I entitled it. History disturbed. And we're going to look at some of the history back there and just see how it works. God's Word gives numerous warnings of trusting extra biblical evidence, especially that considered aged. Paul warns of corruption of God's Word in his day. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God... In the, spirit, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So Paul said in the first century, before the Word of God's complete, there are many which were corrupting the Word of God. You can't trust anybody is what it's pointing out right there. Biblical record of those perverting end times teaching, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. He goes on, their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. These may have been the two that wrote the letter in Thessalonians that Paul referred to as though somebody had uh, said it was a letter from Paul. It may have been people like Hymenaeus, Hymenaeus and Philetus, but what you need to see is here it is in the first century and the word of God is already being corrupted. The writings of the so-called church fathers available today are chock full of heresy. Yes, I said heresy and I'll show it to you. The danger of trusting extra biblical writings like that of the church fathers. Paul testified of the early apostasy and the vicious assault that already plagued the work of God during his day. Consider Paul's farewell message to the church of Ephesus. Acts 20 verse 29. For I know this Then after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. In other words, Paul's saying there are going to be people that are going to come out of the church who will draw disciples after themselves because they're not worried about the truth. 
They just want to get disciples. Leaders, even those appointed by Paul, under God's direction, have one thing in common with the spiritual carnivores. Both desire that people follow them rather than following Jesus. You got the same thing today. Just turn on your television. But you had it in the first century. It's important to understand that. The corruption of the early church fathers, the only genuine and 100% trustworthy writings of the church fathers, if you want to call them that, are those inspired writings of the actual apostles and prophets given by divine inspiration recorded in the 66 books of the Bible. These men found in the pages of Scripture give to us the faith once delivered unto the saints. The faith they gave to us is able to make us perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Any writings of the so-called church fathers that came after the inspired writings of Scripture do not contain one jot or one tittle of divine revelation. In fact, the partial record of the early centuries and the surviving writings have been heavily edited and filtered by Rome. They are not doctrinally sound and have absolutely no authority and should be cautiously read. The term church father is actually a misnomer derived by the Roman Catholic Church using their false doctrine of hierarchical church polity. The so-called church fathers were not fathers of the church in any scriptural sense and had no divine authority. All of the extant writings of the church fathers were infected with some false doctrine and most of them were seriously infected with heresy. They also reflect no agreement in doctrine amongst themselves. Even the apostolic fathers, living shortly after Christ in the second century, were teaching the false gospel that baptism, celibacy, and martyrdom provided forgiveness of sins. In the latter church fathers, that's Clement, Origen, Cyril, Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, Theodore, John Chrysostom, we find the roots of most every heresy that later blossomed. In germ form appear the dogmas of purgatory, transubstantiation, priestly mediation, baptismal regeneration, and the whole sacramental system. One of the post nicene fathers, Leo the Great, some say he was the first pope, 440 to 461. You can see a book here by Pope Benedict from St. Leo to the great uh, Peter Lombard. In other words, these men that they quote are considered church fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. It is safe to say that the church fathers are actually the fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. They are the men who laid the foundation of apostasy that later produced Romanism and other spiritual schisms. Paul repeatedly warned the believers that false teachers would come from without, but also warned that they would arise from within their own ranks. 2 Corinthians 11.4 For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom... We have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bear with him. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into what? Into the apostles of Christ. You cannot trust something just because it's antiquated. In fact, it's just the opposite is true. If it lasted that long and got through the, the dark ages, we got problems. No marvel for Satan himself has transformed an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Peter devoted an entire chapter to the damage done to Israel by its corrupt prophets. He used this history to illustrate the damage that would be done in the early church by its many teachers. 2 Peter 2.1, But there are false prophets also among the people, Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you, the church, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. John gave similar warnings in his epistles. 1 John 2.18, he says, Now are many antichrists. They went out from us. They went out from us. So you cannot go to the church fathers and tell me what I'm supposed to believe. 1 John 4.1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Many false prophets are gone out into the world. In addressing the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus Christ warned that many of the apostolic churches were already weak and were under severe stress from heretical attacks. John addressed many doctrinal problems to seven local churches in Asia Minor. The church of Ephesus, 
uh, you know, had false apostles, liars, members who were no longer loving Jesus amongst their number. The church in Smyrna had blasphemers, liars, false Jews, Satanists, causing them much tribulation. The church in Pergamos had money-loving, lying ministers promoting sin and iniquity, as did Balaam of old. They had others who were teaching the exaltation of one class of believer over another. God said they had need of repentance and that he was prepared to fight against them. Be careful of the church fathers. The church in Thyatira, Revelation 2.20, not, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants. Are you kidding me? You're going to take me outside the Bible? This is my one authority right here. I have no authority but this right here. The church in Sardis had grown careless and had important things on the verge of dying was failing to be watchful. The church in Philadelphia, it's often praised, but it was told it just has a little strength. The church of Laodicea was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, had pushed Jesus out of its gathering altogether. These were first century churches that John wrote to. And you want to tell me about going back to the church fathers? I don't think so. Revelation 3.15 gives you the verse. The Roman Catholic Church was in power for a full millennium, 1,000 years. And its inquisition reached to the farthest corners of Europe and beyond. Rome did everything in its power to destroy the writings of those who differed with her. Consider the Waldensians. These were Bible-believing Christians who lived in northern Italy and France and elsewhere during the Dark Ages and were viciously persecuted by Rome for centuries. Though we know that the Waldensians have a history... A historical record was completely destroyed by Rome, almost completely destroyed. Only a handful of Waldensian writings were preserved from all those centuries. Go read the, about the Waldensians, they'll do you a lot more good. It is not surprising, therefore, that the extant writings from the early centuries are ones that are sympathetic to Rome's doctrines. This does not prove that most of the churches then held to Roman Catholic doctrine. It proves only that those writings sympathetic to Rome were allowed to survive. We know that there were many churches in existence in those early centuries that did not agree with Roman doctrine because they were persecuted by the Romanists and mentioned as persecuted in the writings of the church fathers. Five minutes. The heresy of the so-called church fathers. Ignatius, he was the bishop of Antioch in the early second century. He taught that the churches should have elders and a ruling bishop. All the churches on earth are part of one universal church on earth. I wonder where that led to. <laughs> Justin Martyr. When Justin embraced Christianity, he held on to some of his pagan philosophy. He was known for interpreting the scriptures allegorically and mystically. He helped develop the idea of a middle state after death. There was neither heaven nor hell. Eventually, his doctrine became Rome's purgatory. And that's why they named churches called St. Justin Martyr Catholic Church. Arrhenius. I have his book right here, Against Heresies. Now you're going to tell me that I can read this book and know what he wrote 2,000 years ago almost. Really? Really? I, in the front it says edited by so-and-so and, -so and edited. This, this is the copy that I have. Arrhenius was a pastor in Lones, France, who wrote a polemic entitled Against Heresies about 185, AD 185. He supported the authority of the bishop as a ruler over many churches. He defended church tradition beyond what the scripture allows. There's a picture of Arrhenius. You say, how do you know that's a picture of him? The same way I know that this book is from him. <laughs> For this reason, Arrhenius is claimed by the Roman Catholic Church as one of their own. He taught the Catholic heresy of real presence, saying the Eucharist becomes the body of Christ. Arrhenius has already been mentioned by Joe. I don't trust this writing here. That's not where my authority is. Clement of Alexandria, head of the Allegorizing School of Alexandria from 190 to 202. Pantheus founded this school. Clement intermingled the philosophy of Plato with Christianity, helped develop the doctrine of purgatory, and believed that most men would eventually be saved after suffering for their sins in purgatory. Tertullian, I can't go through all of it. Apostolic succession, he believed the bread of the Lord's Supper was Christ, and he worried about dropping crumbs of it on the ground. He believed in water baptism brought forgiveness of sins, confession of sins to a bishop. He taught that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist and when God was not a father. He taught that Mary was the second Eve 
who by her obedience remedied the disobedience of the first Eve. These are the church fathers. Cyprian, he believed in infant baptism. Origen, I can't even go into the problems Origen caused for the church. And on and on about Origen. Eusebius of Caesarea, same thing. He collected Origen's works. There are books put out, Surprised by Truth and the Road to Rome, that tell about people that read the church fathers and converted to Roman Catholicism. I personally have people that I know that's true about. Here's one quote at the bottom from one of these books. I started reading the early church fathers and realized that whatever they believed, they surely weren't Protestant. Catholic themes peppered the landscape of a church history. I couldn't deny it. And what do they do? They go back to Rome. The church fathers were instrumental in the con conversion of Peter Kreft to Rome. And, it, and I could tell you a story about him, but I won't. Conclusion. The testimony of the apostles and the testimony of the apostolic churches and the testimony of the post-apostolic churches give us no reason to look to the church fathers for our interpretation or understanding of the scriptures. We trust the Bible and rely upon it as our absolute and only completely trustworthy authority for all matters of faith and practice. The Word of God tells us to suspect rather than trust anyone seeking to convince us to buy into a teaching by appealing to men. We are warned to stay away from whatever doctrine they're seeking to promote. One minute. Second Corinthians 4, 2 says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The idea is that these men in the early centuries were the earliest disciples of the disciples of Jesus. But consider the fallacy of trusting in men. Peter was a disciple of Jesus. Peter was a disciple of Jesus who denied the Lord three times. Paul had to go to him in Galatians and rebuke him for his hypocrisy. And we're going to believe the church fathers? I don't trust anybody except the Scripture. I'll read my Bible. I get up every morning, I read my Bible. That's what I do. Thomas said he wouldn't believe unless he placed his finger in the wounds. You think, I'm going to trust Thomas? And he's in the Bible. Judas was a disciple of Jesus, and he was a devil. Thank you, Mr. Stoffer. <laughs> Mr. Schimmel, you have five minutes to rebut. All right, appreciate that. I would just like to say I agree with Doug Stoffer that we shouldn't trust any man, uh, that no man uh, is our authority. Authority is the word of God, amen? amen? But if we agree with Doug to just tune out every man, every man that speaks to you about truth, why is he even up here speaking? Right? He's, after, he's not the Bible, but we look to him, and I'm sure he has a lot of great things to share. Uh, and we don't throw him out. I don't throw out everything he says because I disagree with certain areas where he's off. And I also don't categorize everybody that, or his beliefs, and say every other pre-tribber believes how he believes, because there's quite a difference there, too. All the church fathers before Roman Catholic Church came in the 4th century were very diverse in certain areas as far as when he brings up a, a situation here or there, it wasn't uniform within the church fathers. The church fathers didn't uniformly believe and teach as a group that uh, Jesus, the wafer, became the body of Jesus, okay? Uh, let's make a distinction between the Roman Catholic Church and the church fathers that I typically quote the anti-Nicene fathers means before the Council of Nicaea, before Roman Catholicism. And the only reason I look at uh, the church fathers is because I like to look at history. I like to see what was taught and who taught what. How many of you believe in Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? Amen? Do you think the church was still going on or it had to be restored after the apostles through Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell or Mary Baker Eddy or someone? The church was continuing in the second and third century. Amen? And there were people that loved truth, and there were people that stood against the heresies. And the reason certain church fathers are celebrated and praised as far as a witness to Scripture is because you know there was a lot of uh, attacks on the Scripture. Who do you think it is that protected the Scripture against the Gnostics? You wouldn't even have the Scripture right now if it wasn't for the early church fathers, God using them to preserve it. Even the King James translators, and Doug Stoffer is a King James-only gentleman, but his King James translators relied on the church fathers. Do we throw the King James Bible out now? And I'll prove that later in my talk. Also, Dallas Theological Seminary, a bastion of pre-tribulationism. I see Thomas Ice in the crowd. 
And you know what? I praise God for the research they've done in the church fathers to support premillennialism, to show that there's a thousand-year reign of Christ, and to show that the Catholic Church rejects that, but the early church fathers fought against those who allegorized the scriptures and disagreed with that. Futurism, that, that, that post and priest hold to. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a few more things about that before I start going to my slides, because I know my time is going quick. But uh, the Trinity was defended rigorously by, and the deity of Christ. We, we quote the church fathers when, when we talk to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses to, to prove some of those points. But I want to show you some statements, the things which you have heard from me, Paul says, and trust these to faithful men who will entrust to others. Now I want to show you, this is from the 1611, pretty cool, uh, King James, the original King James. And guess who's in the margin there being quoted? Christostom, one of the men that Doug Stoffer just condemned. Yet he's a King James only gentleman. Yet they relied on the early church fathers. Isn't that interesting? Do we throw the King James out because they relied to a degree on the early church fathers to get what they felt? There's, the, there's in the margin. I know it looks like two F's, but in uh, 1611, Elizabethan English, the F's didn't have you know, crossbars, they were really S's. John Overall served as a translator in the first Westminster Company of the King James translation because of his expertise in the King James, I'm sorry, in the church fathers. His name is in the 1611 version of 613. Samuel Gipp, who is a, a, a pretty well-known King James-only guy, he says overall was vital for the translation because of his knowledge of the quotations of the early church fathers. Do you know you can put the whole Bible together practically just from the quotations of Scripture from the church fathers? They were into the word. The Didache was post-tribulational. It was the earliest writing that we know outside of Scripture. It was a catechism used in the early church, and it was clearly post-tribulational. Okay? But my concern would be here. One I'm going to skip some guys. Because I only have a minute left. Well, what would the church fathers have thought of my brother here and his teachings? Okay, you know what? I'm going to have to uh, do two different things in a moment. Yeah, okay. that's okay. We're, we're still in good shape because I still was able to share what I wanted to share in the rebuttal. But I want to say this is the early church fathers, when it came to their emphasis, uh, they over and over again were post-tribulational. That's what I was prepared to show you. But instead, he's attacking everybody in the 2nd and 3rd century as though there were no Christians. But I'll show you in my presentation coming up pretty soon that there's some very important things that we need to consider along these lines. Uh, the church fathers weren't perfect, just as Doug and I aren't perfect. And some of them I won't even quote as far as saying, hey, this is a great man of God, like origin and what have you. But I'll also say I can at least see what the early church, when there's a consensus of what they were all teaching, guess what? It's pretty orthodox. <clears throat> compared to most of the stuff, what's, especially what's going on today. Thank you, Mr. Shim. Thank you. Let's move on to your uh, presentation. All right. I'm going to ask Tony to come up here, because my presentation might be a little shorter now, and I'm going to work, and you can stick the rebuttal on right after this. Okay. Uh, the rebuttal for the history. Okay. All right. So we're going to... Uh, yep. uh, no, but I'm going to want the rebuttal after this, so you can sit up here in the consum if you want to stay up there, brother. Uh, so Paul wanted to communicate. I mentioned Christostom uh, being mentioned. Uh, King James translators, not just John, doc, uh, Dr. Overall. And he's not famous for wearing overalls or inventing overalls. It was because he was a King James translator who was an expert in the church fathers. But I also want you to know and understand that, that uh, we're told that in the last days false prophets and corruptors will be plenty. And sheep will be turned into wolves, and love will be turned into hate. For the whole time of your faith will not profit you unless you have reached the, the goal in the last time. And then the world deceiver, speaking of the Antichrist, will appear as though he's God's son and perform signs and wonders. He tells us at the very end of that, but the ones who endure in their faith will be saved. The early church fathers, this was the Didache. The Didache is dated, some dated to 5560 in the first century when the apostles were still living. Others debated or date a little further in the first century. Yet what we have with these men, which I think is absolutely amazing, is we have a catechism that was used in the early church. And when you read the Didache, I'd like to see what kind of problem you would have, Doug, with the Didache. Because that was used in the early church to protect the church. And it quotes from the Gospel of Luke. It quotes from the Gospel of Matthew. By the way, it's a great document because we're able to say to skeptics and liberals who say, oh, the Gospels weren't written into the second or third century. We can say, hey, wait a minute. The Didache is quoting those writings in the first century. Amen? And it quotes them and it talks about holy living and living for Jesus. And it talks about the, the glorious Gospel and so forth. <sighs> to Angel Church of Pergamum. To the angel of the church of Pergamum. You know, when he's writing to the angels, he's not writing to angels like angels need to learn something. The word's angelos. He's talking to the messengers. 
the leaders of those churches, churches. You know who the leader of the church of Pergamum was? Well, who was the leader of, the, so there's different leaders. There's leaders of the church of Smyrna, the angel church of Smyrna. Guess who many believe that was? Polycarp. Polycarp, 86 years I have served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? He was martyred, guys, for his faith. Now, we saw a beautiful video about a Romanian, several Romanians that stood up for Jesus and wanted freedom and what have you, right? Would we all of a sudden start picking on them and start heaping coals upon them and so forth because, you know, we don't agree with everything they said? Should we heap coals upon Polycarp? who many believe was the bishop of Smyrna that Jesus addressed that letter to, whether he was or not, he's acclaimed highly as one of the early church fathers. In fact, Thomas Ice writes beautifully this. It's important to note that Irenaeus was from Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor is in modern Turkey, uh, in that area where the Chep Seven Church is written to. He says the Apostle John was from Ephesus, which is also in Asia Minor. Irenaeus was discipled in the faith by Polycarp, who was discipled by the Apostle John. <laughs> Thus, there's a direct link between the one who wrote Revelation and who? Irenaeus. Guess who wrote this? Thomas Ice, who's one of the top defenders of the pre-trib doctrine of this day. He doesn't throw Irenaeus out. He knows he's a great champion for premillennialism. However, we also learn from Thomas Ice, when taken within the context of all of Irenaeus' writings, it appears that he was not teaching pre-tribulationism. He says this in the context of somebody saying, maybe Irenaeus was a pre-tribber. We also read that Irenaeus talks about how the Antichrist would appear and he'd put the church to flight. There was no other teaching. It wasn't as though pre-trib was being squished. It had never shown up in the first three centuries. They were just believing Jesus Christ is coming back. We're going to face what Jesus said, the abomination of desolation. Paul said concerning Christ's coming and our being gathered together to him, he said not to be deceived by word or letter or spirit as, or letter from us or a spirit like a demon as though that day has come or is at hand. He said, for the day of the Lord or the day of Christ shall not come except there come a fallen away first. And the man has seen me reveal the son of perdition who opposes himself above God and all called God as worship to God. So he sits in the temple of God showing himself as though he is God. Paul warns, don't be deceived into believing that the rapture will take place before the fallen away and the Antichrist. And he warns about letters. What kind of letters do you think he was concerned about? I would, I would totally agree with Doug Stoffer. We've got to test everything by Scripture. The letters he's concerned about is anybody that would take his teaching or claim to be teaching what Paul taught or sending a letter from Paul, that teaching that the resurrection, as he said, has come to pass or you've missed the rapture or what have you. He says, no, the Antichrist and fallen away take place first. And these men were defenders of what Paul wrote against those who were teaching false teaching. In fact, Tertullian came against certain Gnostics who were teaching that the resurrection had come to pass. And he quoted 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. To say, no, Paul says the resurrection is not until after the Antichrist. So they were defending the truth against false teachers, especially the Gnostics. We read right here in Irenaeus. He says, but he, John, indicates the number of the name. Now in order that when this man comes, we may avoid him by being aware of who he is. That's quite amazing. He want, so in other words, the book of Revelation. Keep in mind, Irenaeus sat under Polycarp. Who sat under who? The Apostle John. And he's, his understanding was the revelation is written to the church to warn us about the coming Antichrist. There was no idea of a pre trib rapture. But you know, the reason Doug is attacking and attacking and attacking the church fathers as though they have no value to offer. And as though we, you know, several centuries later, we have something to offer. We could talk to you. Listen to us. Something's wrong with that. I, I'm not saying I trust them as the word of God. They don't trust them. I don't trust Doug. I don't trust myself. Huh, I trust just the word of God. But if I'm going to say, listen to Doug, Joe, or the church fathers, I would trust the church fathers more than I would Doug and Joe even. Not all of them and not everything they said, but these guys, man, they have so much. They didn't have concordances. They didn't, have, they didn't go to Strong's. They had scripture like memorized like crazy. And they were guarding the scripture. They were guarding the gospel. They were martyred. Doug and I haven't been martyred for the faith, many of them. And this is before Roman Catholicism. That's what I'm talking about. Did some slip into certain errors? Yeah. And we rebuke those errors just as we would rebuke any other errors that we see today. Amen. David Reagan, a leading pre-tribulational teacher, he says, the oldest viewpoint regarding the rapture is called the historic premillennialism. That's my position. He says, this view is based on a literal interpretation of what the Bible says will happen in the end times. One of its distinctive features is that it places the rapture of the church at the end of the tribulation. This is the pre trevor admitting this. Combining it with the second coming as one event. Amen. And that's why Doug has, that's one of the reasons Doug has such a hard time with them. Because they don't have his new view. 
which wasn't around then. He's the one that came up with a new view that's not in Scripture, or as I should say, come on the bandwagon with these others. This post-review he's talking about, Reagan again, is the only systematic view of the end-time events that existed during the first 300 years of the church. There was no debate on pre or post, guys. He goes on to say, Justin Martyr, who was born in the AD 100, went so far in his writings on the subject so as to suggest that anyone with a different viewpoint was what? Heretical. So I could understand why Doug would have a hard time with these church fathers because they would view his point as heretical. I don't claim that Doug is a her- I don't say that Doug is a heretic, but I'm saying he's right, the church fathers, because the pre trib view, and this is David Reagan, a pre trib admitting this, would, would look at it like, wow, that is strange doctrine. His doctrine would be considered the new doctrine and the strange doctrine relative to eschatology. What, well, I have seven and a half minutes, so I'm halfway through. But I have, but uh, we read this from Justin Martyr, but I, and, and by the way, his name's Justin Martyr, and it wasn't because his parents gave him the last name Martyr, guys. He died for the faith. You should read his dialogue with Trifle the Jew, and Trifle was talking about how the law is still in effect and what have you, the Mosaic law, and he's talking about how Christians don't have to keep the Sabbath to be saved. We're saved by Jesus Christ and what he's done. And he stood up for these doctrines. And when we look in church history, I read the church fathers, and I'm like, wow, some of these guys are awesome men of God that love Jesus, that gave themselves for the faith. And uh, it's hard for me to criticize guys like that, Doug. I can criticize words. They were off in certain areas, just like we can criticize each other. But I would not demean them just because they didn't teach your view. But I and whoever are on all points right-minded Christians, this is what Justin Martyr said, Know that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged as the apostles Ezekiel, Isaiah, and others declare. He's looking for the resurrection. Two advents, we read from Justin Martyr, have been announced. The one in which he is set forth as a suffering and glorious, dishonored, and crucified. But the other, the next advent, the first one was when he came to be crucified, which he shall come from heaven with glory when the man of apostasy who speaks strange things against the Most High, shall venture to do unlawful things against or on the earth against us Christians. See, they all recognize. And that, that's how the truth was accepted, guys. You guys, many of you know we're heading in dark times right now, right? It's getting really ugly even in our country. The last days, you've got the book of Revelation. You've got Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. You've got 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You've got the book of Daniel. You should be looking at these books and not saying, oh, this isn't for us. We'll be gone. God's given these things to you. And even back then, they were saying, hey, we need to pay attention to what Jesus is saying. And the irony to me is this is a prophecy conference, guys. And we're saying, oh, look what's going to happen. But we, it's almost like entertainment. But we're gone. We're, we're not going to be here. Don't fool yourself. Don't write off the church fathers and everything they said because it doesn't agree with your theology or eschatology. Check everything they, out, they said according to Scripture. The Antichrist will wage war against the church. Tertullian, Cyprian says the same thing. Uh, the devil will avenge himself under Antichrist against the church. Victorinus, or you can call him Victorinus, by the way, he's the first one that wrote a commentary in the book of Revelation. And he saw that the church would be persecuted. So, uh, Ephraim, the Syrian, and I'm not going to have time to go through all the church. I was going to go through all the church history, but I had to deal with some of the stuff he, he had brought up. because I got, my, I got five minutes. That's about the same amount as my rebuttal time. So, Tony, if you could put the rebuttal up there for church history, that would be great. What's that? No, no, I didn't. I just yes, touched on it. Yes, you did. No, I've got five minutes. I didn't, yeah, go five minutes all, I didn't go through all of my rebuttal. I stopped because I wanted to get to this. Thank you so I much. I understand. So I can use my okay. five minutes how I want. Amen? That's all right. Praise the Lord. Got freedom still in this country. All right. Thank you so much, brother. By the way, you want to know who did all these wonderful graphics? It's Tony right there. He Give him a hand. He's amazing. Oh, I'm sorry. No clapping. I'm so sorry, brother. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tony. It's not about us. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, the church fathers warn about the war. You know the New Age movement today? The new spirituality that's so attacking Christianity, biggest movie mo- movement in our country. It's based on the Nag Hammadi texts and the Gnostics. They would have overrun the church, but God used the church fathers to stand against Marcion and other Gnostics. And they warn about the Pontic mouse known as Marcion, who was nine had the nine powers of a mouse to gnaw away at the gospel and not at the pieces. They were protecting the gospels against these teachers, guys. In fact, it's interesting because when you read here in Irenaeus, I, don't want to, I can't read everything he says here, but he says all the Christian churches, this is second century. He was the top apologist defending the faith, him and Justin Martyr, in the second century. And he warns, if you look at the very end of this, he talks about a man who of much greater weight and of more steadfast witness of truth than Valentinius and Marcion and the rest of the heretics. They called these guys out as heretics because you know what Marcion was doing? 
Marcion just accepted the writings of Paul to the church. All the other light writings, 1st and 2nd John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd and and John, 1st, 2nd Peter, Hebrews, and James, the book of Jude, Revelation, and the Gospels, except that heavily edited Luke, Gospel of Luke, he rejected. He just used Paul's writings. So the early church fathers recognized he was rejecting the apostolic writings as not being for the church. Well, guess what? I think they would have a hard time with Doug, personally. Since Doug is attacking them, I'm going to let you know they would have a hard time with Doug, and he's right. And they would have a hard time because there's some... He rejected the Gospels, the epistles of Paul. In Doug's book, one book, rightly divided. I want you to see what he does here. He has a whole section called Who's Mail? And he warns against reading somebody else's mail as though it's written to the church. Guess what books you're not supposed to read because they're not written to the church directly? Everything but Paul. That's why he was emphasizing PP, the letters P in the 13 epistles that Paul wrote. Because he doesn't believe they're addressed directly to the church. And just like Marcion who rejected them, now he still believes they're scripture. Marcion didn't. I need to be fair. And Marcion, he believed that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New are different. Doug affirms the Trinity, the deity of Christ. He loves Jesus. I count him a brother who loves Jesus. But he's fallen into this tendency. He gives a list of all these books that were written by Paul that are for the church. And then you see the different ages he has. Romans to Philemon. That's the church age but, uh, that we're in right now. But after, and then Paul's name is on those epistles. But then he shows the epistles that are not part of the church age. We're not written to the church. And guess what? It's Hebrews through what? Revelation. Okay. That's the tribulation, second coming millennium. Then under that, you see what? For the tribulation period, Hebrews for, through Revelation. See, he recognizes there's warnings to endure the tribulation and things like that. But he, and so he would agree with me, but he'd say, but, but no, but they're not for us. They're for, the, well, they're for the tribulation saints, these books. Readiness, tribulation era. Notice what books are under there on the bottom right in yellow. Hebrews through what? Revelation. Paul's 13 epistles, church age next to that. The readiness, tribulation. Paul's 13 epistles are in the church age, but here we see what? The gospels, and this parenthesis happens in the church age, is for Paul's writings, then Hebrews 2 Revelation is a tribulation period. The Lord Jesus said, go therefore make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to what? The end of the age. We're not supposed to relegate Jesus' One teaching minute. to the tribulation period, guys. We're supposed to follow his teachings right now. In fact, Paul warned of those who, uh, anyone who advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those who are Lord Jesus Christ and with doctrines conforming to godliness. We need to teach the words of Jesus. Amen? The church is not built on Paul. He said Paul's, you know, the church. The church is built on what? The foundation of the what? Apostles, plural. All their writings, guys. Amen? They're all, you're not reading someone else's mail when you're reading the writings of the apostles, guys. You're reading the mail right to you. Okay, and we're built on... Christ Jesus himself being the head cornerstone, amen? I've got 25 seconds left or less, so I'm going to move right through here. Hey, I'm sorry, I was rushed, man. I had to get that in, man, because I started with the gospel instead of rebuttal. But my concern is, when we look at what Doug is talking about, the church fathers would have rejected what he was saying and looked at him more along the lines of Marcion, and he's attacking the Thank martyrs you, for Mr. the faith. Schimmel. I disagree. Thank you. Mr. Stauffer, you have five minutes to rebut. Well, the book that he's quoting was written 15 years ago, and I don't agree with everything I wrote, so I certainly wouldn't agree with everything that was written by the church fathers. Um, that book has gone into five different editions. In fact, it's been out of print for two years and will stay out of print until I get it the way I want. He said I didn't believe in reading. This is Hebrews right here. That I didn't agree that you should read. This is, you know, you can go through and this is Hebrews right here. And we can keep going back. This is my Bible. This is what I read every day. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So there's my answer. Now what I want to do is deal with something he didn't deal with, and that's Margaret MacDonald maligned. Claims the origin of the pre-tribulation teaching generally use an ad hominem arguments by claiming it's satanic, occultic, demonic associations. They'll say John Nelson Darby, Edward Irving, Emmanuel Lacunza, and Margaret MacDonald. This picture is from his DVD. Left behind or led astray. Chapter 6, a whole section on Margaret MacDonald. Here she is, picture after picture from the movie that he did. Margaret McDonald's connection to a pre-tribulation teaching 
turns out to be a hoax. In fact, I, well, let me not get ahead of myself. This is the guy that came up with it. Dave McPherson is credited, and that's from the video there, with discovering the connection of the pre-tribulation rapture to a 15-year-old Margaret McDonald's ecstatic utterance in Port Glasgow, Scotland in 1830. Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. That's what this thing is on Margaret McDonald. This is University of Glasgow, Scotland. If you go there, this is what you'll find. This is me in Scotland. And this is the memoirs that you'll find that Margaret McDonald's ecstatic utterance is in. I have a copy out on the table. You can check it out for yourself. But right now, I'm going to pull it apart. I know she's not a church father, but I don't trust her either. And listen, it doesn't mean I don't trust anything the church father said. I don't agree with everything I've written. I, have, I, I edit my stuff. I've written a dozen books. You know what I do when I rewrite a book? When a book gets out of print? I change it. Because I learn. I grow. I'm growing. So you look at the account. It starts on page 171. talks about a footnote. And she names an antichrist. Pretty interesting that she figured this guy was the antichrist. And she's pre-trib. Wait a minute. Aren't we leaving before the Antichrist if we're pre-trib? Well, there, there she gives them with a false Antichrist right at the very beginning. Luke 21, 25, she quotes that. Post-trib is what it is. She, does not, she was not a pre-trib teacher. She quotes Matthew 24, 30. She goes in in the context of the majority of Margaret McDonald's ecstatic, convoluted utterance or post-tribulational with a, fr- a few pre-tribulational passages put in there. Matthew 25, 1. Matthew chapter 17, all of these are post-tribulational. That's what's in her utterance. Matthew 24, Luke chapter 17 again. You go to page 173. She jumps into Revelation chapter 21. She does throw some, she mixes them together. But what I want to do is get you to a point where you can see on the bottom of the screen here, notice that she has the Antichrist, the church, intermixed. That's because that's what she believed. Margaret MacDonald taught that the Antichrist appears on earth while the church is still here. This contradicts the pre-tribulation rapture teaching of the Bible and contradicts the Bible. Oh, look at this one here. I don't want to skip this one. Look at that underline in bright red. After she quotes Luke chapter 21, she says, The trial of the church is from Antichrist. Now you tell me... Who came up with this Margaret McDonald stuff? I don't know, but I know in Joe's video, it's a very, 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 very impacting thing. You go in Matthew chapter 3, she's all convoluted on that. You go to the last page, 176, she quotes Matthew 24, Matthew 25, and she's pre-trib and came up with it? Are you kidding me? The analysis of Margaret McDonald's vision pertains to the end times. She quotes the epistles four times, Revelation four times, uh, Gospels 13 times. Margaret McDonald's vision was undeniably post-trib and not pre-trib. And it is wrong to say that she came up with a pre-trib teaching. Vladimir Lenin, he launched the communist era in Russia. He said, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. If you've ever heard about Margaret McDonald starting this whole thing, and then Darby and Irving and Lacunza and all that. It is a blatant lie. Just like Stalin, just like Lenin. You tell it often enough and it becomes the truth. And he has it in his video. Thank you, Mr. Schimmel. I mean, Mr. Stoffer. I knew I was going to do that eventually.